All right, I guess we can count that as everybody who wanted to return already returned. Um, it's a pleasure for me to welcome you to our third panel, Good Neighborhood or More, How to Optimize Cooperation Between Poland and Ukraine. Um, my name is Josef Lang, I'm from Warsaw Enterprise Institute. First, let me begin by um, introducing um, our speakers. Uh, we have four excellent uh, experts uh, with us today. Um, Jadwiga Rogoza, Senior Fellow from the Center for Eastern Studies, Warsaw, Poland. Uh, we have Nadia Koval, Head of Information and uh, Analysis Department at uh, the Ukrainian Institute. We have uh, Łukasz Adamski, Deputy Director of the Miroszewski Center. And uh, Mihailo Drapak, European Studies Program Director, uh, Foreign Policy Council, Ukrainian Prism. Um, in the previous panels, uh, we've heard um, a lot about how this year um, shaped uh, the Polish-Ukrainian uh, cooperation and how Polish-Ukrainian cooperation also shaped the events um, of the last year. Uh, a lot has been said about uh, the scale of these events, its significance, um, and it's really hard to add something um, on top of that. Um, but uh, I'm going to begin with a brief four numbers, which I think illustrate uh, the scale, I mean, this potential um, of uh, Polish, uh, of what happened during uh, the last year uh, in the Polish-Ukrainian cooperation. And uh, these numbers um, uh, are as following. Um, in July of last year, Polish Economic Institute uh, made a study of how much the Polish society uh, helped and contributed to uh, Ukrainian refugees, um, to helping out uh, Ukraine. And we're not talking about Polish state or state institutions, we're just talking about the Polish society, ordinary people, uh, civil society, etc. And um, in, in their study, um, they, um, uh, they researched, they analyzed that Polish citizens out of their own pockets between February and July last year spent almost three and a half billion euros on helping um, helping uh, Ukrainian refugees and support to uh, to Ukraine, uh, which as in scale of ordinary donations from ordinary citizens, I think it shows the support of the um, of the Polish society. 77% um, of uh, adult uh, adults in Poland were involved in helping uh, Ukrainian refugees during the first waves, uh, during the first months of the uh, of the full-scale war, and 7% of people in Poland hosted um, Ukrainian refugees in their homes. So if we uh, uh, if we calculate that into millions of people, it really shows the scale of events. And uh, on the other hand, uh, if we look at the Ukrainian society, uh, we have um, uh, polls which say that 97% of Ukrainians uh, view Poland uh, positively, which again, Mathematically, there is very small, uh, small room for even higher numbers. So it shows, um, it shows this great potential. It shows, um, it shows that there is, um, there is substance that um, that the uh, future uh, cooperation between Poland and Ukraine can uh, be built upon. And uh, this future cooperation is our main subject of this um, of this panel. And uh, as with anything which, uh, which involves future, uh, it's less tangible than the events which, which already took place. But if we, um, if we try to look at it, the most important questions which, um, which rise in this are um, what, is, what should be the target, mo uh, target model of the uh, future Polish-Ukrainian relations? What challenges and opportunities um, uh, has the war brought and what challenges and opportunities still await for us in the future. And finally, uh, how the um, EU membership criteria, how uh, Ukraine's efforts uh, to join the European Union, uh, how, will they, um, uh, how will they impact the Polish-Ukrainian relations, but also how Polish-Ukrainian uh, relations can impact them. Um, in order to um, to discuss all of these issues, but also to uh, to fit within the time frame, uh, I'm going to ask the speakers for um, five minutes uh, statements at first. And my first general question, um, uh, because we raised a lot of issues, but my first general questions would be, what processes do you see uh, that influence the future uh, Polish-Ukrainian uh, relations the most? What are the um, what are the areas that we should be focusing on when discussing future Polish-Ukrainian relations. And uh, the first speaker is uh, Jadwiga Rogoza. 
Thank you very much. Dear friends, allow me to say a couple of words in Ukrainian and then I would move to English. I just wanted to say about obvious but very touching thing that Yusuf already mentioned. I would just like to continue his thought. Uh, the mutual rapprochement of uh, Ukraine and Poland as a result of Russian aggression is unprecedented. We have always been neighbors, but what's happening now? is the deepening of mutual connections on an unprecedented level, on very many levels. The bravery of Ukraine on the one hand and solidarity of Poland on the other hand. And also, what's important, our same perception of threats from Russia. All this brings us together and that makes us not just partners and allies, but also brotherly nations. As Yusuf said, it's not just a country, it's not just a state, it's also people, nations. And uh, at the same time that weakens anti-Polish arguments of some radical Ukrainian circles, and in Poland as well, uh, these anti-Ukrainian forces have become marginalized. They are still present. But I would say they're not just weak, they are caricaturized. So that's also a thing that we can capitalize on immensely. There are lots of levels and even experts or somebody else, it's hard to list all of those. And in my opinion, that's very good that we cannot even list all of them, all of those levels of our cooperation. So let me switch to English now. And uh, first of all, we. Uh, can talk about the situation in Ukraine in terms of challenges, but each challenge brings a chance. And I would say that today Ukraine is stretched between huge costs and huge uh, uh, losses that the war brought and equally profound changes and, and chances that it brings between because the destruction uh, that Russia inflicts in Ukraine is also the destruction of Ruski Mir, the destruction of Soviet ar um, architecture and infrastructure, the structure of Soviet mindset or post-Soviet mindset that was still present in parts. So, uh, uh, Paradoxically, Russia trying to save the empire, trying to save this uh, Ruski Mir, uh, the post-Soviet uh, space that it controlled, uh, it ruins it in, at accelerated speed. Uh, and it only speeds up the processes that were taking place in Ukraine as, uh, for, for the last 30 years. Um, and today, uh, one of the deepest uh, processes that is really viable for our future cooperation is the strengthening of Ukrainian identity. Uh, and these identities today seen not only in cultural terms or national terms, it's seen in terms of uh, national security. And this is important because uh, this shaky character of uh, Ukrainian identity was thought to be this factor that facilitated for Russia to have, uh, you know, cultural dominance that also involved uh, later on political military uh, uh, expansions in Ukraine. Uh, so at the moment, this threat to Ukrainian statehood and sovereignty it really boosted uh, uh, the feeling of empowerment inside Ukraine. And I would say that maybe this is just my outlook, but I th before I saw that Ukrainians were often treating their own country as kind of a second-rate country, uh, uh, weak in many respects. Now this is replaced by great pride, uh, feeling as the sense of, of being uh, not only a source of bravery uh, and military might, but also a source of uh, uh, resilience, creativity, innovations, something Ukraine has to offer. And I think one of the interesting processes that uh, take place, maybe not always obvious in Poland or in the West, obvious obviously <laughs> in Ukraine itself, is that Ukraine uh, cooperating with the West, uh, with the EU in particular, uh, can be not just a petitioner, uh, a, a candidate, it can also be a donor, it aspires to be a donor, a source of innovations, uh, a source of uh, uh, different, uh, very modern uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, cutting edge technologies, uh, uh, such as in the IT sphere. So this is something interesting and new. Uh, 
uh, Ukraine is now undergoing the process of decolonization. I think this is how we can see it. And decolonization on every level, political, cultural, national, uh, language, religious, mental, everything. And it en entails uh, shaking off this belief that Russia is superior. This belief that it still prevails in the West, I think, in some parts of the West. Ukraine no longer fears Russia, but I think in the West very often you can meet uh, attitudes where Russia is respected, feared and uh, thought to be superior in many ways. Uh, in Ukraine that's over and it's replaced by the sense of Ukraine's superiority towards Russia, towards the, uh, the hegemon. Uh, and uh, today Russia is seen in Ukraine not only as a barbaric country, but also as a backward, inefficient country. Uh, and this pride of uh, their own country in Ukraine uh, is, is really, a, in fact, a very um, big potential for, for, uh, for uh, uh, internal developments, for internal reforms. Uh, and remarkable resilience was shown. I'm, I'm sure this is very obvious to all of you. And, uh, you know, the armed forces fight and work. The state works. State institutions work. Banking systems work. Uh, they were not derailed by uh, a panic uh, attitudes in Ukraine or Russian cyber attacks. Uh, you know, railways uh, work just perfectly well. As uh, there's a joke in Germany that they work, Ukrainian railways work better than the German railways, more punctual. You know, so uh, this is remarkable resilience, and this is a great asset in future cooperation in uh, with the EU or or NATO or other countries. Of course, all this comes at great cost, and this cost is something we can go on for hours. Uh, Ukraine faces demographic slump. Ukraine faces economic ruin. Uh, Ukraine faces uh, impoverishment of the society, the war trauma, which is uh, a serious thing. So all these problems create fears of future assistance and cooperation. And one of the many, I can only list one concrete thing, is you know, the need to clear uh, the occupied territories of m Russian mines at the moment. This is the task for today, not only for tomorrow. Because, uh, you know, the farmers uh, who try to sow their fields in the deoccupied territories, they just die one by one. And, and uh, this is one of the very, very many tasks. There was a group of Polish sappers working in Ukraine recently, about 100 people. But intensive works only uh, produced, you know, moderate results because, you know, the, the task is so huge and the problem is so huge that we have to join forces on this task and many others. Um, uh, I, I, I will uh, be uh, uh, very short on my uh, uh, next points. Uh, the, 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 the scale of destruction also opens the door to reconstruction. And this reconstruction will, will be, of course, uh, uh, um, together with modernization. This is uh, this, uh, this uh, 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 build back better uh, formula. Uh, so uh, we will not reconstruct uh, the, the, the former uh, infrastructure, we will, we will build something new, something much more modern. So it's time to abandon energy intensive and non-ecological energy sphere uh, uh, and, and, and create something new. It's one of the many spheres. Uh, decarbonized Ukrainian energy system. It's also uh, the, uh, probably the end of the oligarchic system as we know it in Ukraine, the pre-war one, uh, because uh, oligarchs are losing assets, losing influence. Uh, and uh, so Ukrainian economy probably will also uh, be transformed uh, thanks to this process. And um, Digitalization and and uh, and many other spheres that uh, Ukraine's Ukraine showed remarkable remarkable achievements so far. Uh, so uh, my my final uh, sentence now will be that Ukraine uh, 
uh, although ruined and uh, and badly uh, badly uh, um, tested during this war, uh, nevertheless of offers a great deal of energy of innovation uh, to to the Western world, to Poland in particular. I can also say something more on bilateral aspects uh, later, but we'll, we'll, we'll I have, we'll have to finish now. For, uh, we'll save that for uh, for later. Maybe. And thank you very much for your input. Uh, without further, uh, further ado, I now hand, uh, hand the floor to uh, Nadia Koval. Uh, thank you. Uh, in our first panel, uh, Mr. Kumok uh, joked one, uh, while uh, presenting Lukas that Lukas was treating Polish-Ukrainian relations before it was cool, which is true in one sense. But in other sense, Polish-Ukrainian relations have been cool uh, to study, to be engaged with, probably for the 30 years of independence. Like when we do any research co connected to foreign policy, Poland would have been always in the leaders. I remember we did like a very general research about uh, how uh, international relations in Ukraine are taught and studied. And unsurprisingly, the most uh, important topics were European integration and area studies in which Polish studies were the most important. For years, we had uh, this polls about how our peoples perceive each other and always po polls were either the most uh, liked or one of the most liked. Yes, we, if we take different statistics, Poland will always be among the leaders. But of course, uh, there is a big uh, but to all this. Uh, we have since uh, maybe again 30 years uh, speaking about a strategic character of relationship between Ukraine and Poland, uh, but actually uh, the practice of this relationship has been a bit closer to good neighborhood than to real strategic uh, partnership. And I think what we have now, we, now we have a chance at real strategic uh, reassessments of this relation and really moving them uh, to, to the next level. Like uh, we have had throughout these uh, 30 years a very good base of cooperation, establishing different um, relations in very, very different sphere, both economic and political and so on and so forth. And if compared, for example, to relations with other countries, for example, with of Central and Eastern Europe and uh, with other countries, okay, our relations with Poland uh, are quite good. But uh, have we used them to the full potentials? Rather, no. And we could see, for example, in the last five to seven years, uh, that uh, this relation uh, was still very good, was still very productive, but it was running out of some, I don't know, biggest strategic vision, what we are both heading to. Uh, like, uh, we had uh, this idea for Poland as an advocate for Ukraine in the European Union, but at the same time, it was very visible that uh, this should be reconsidered. For example, uh, in 2014-2019, uh, when we have already signed the association agreement and the liberalized with the regime, it was for the whole European Union, not so much the question of deeper, uh, further integration of Ukraine as the member state, but mostly we were already talking about uh, like saving these accomplishments and uh, uh, staying where we are, yes? Like in the whole European Union, a more prevalent idea was that this neighborhood should be rather stabilized than integrated, that we should treat Russia in a more conciliatory way uh, through dialogue and so on and so forth. And uh, we can uh, speak uh, a lot about why could not we develop this relationship strategically in that strategic environment? Why there are some limits, for example, of Poland's ability to shape uh, the foreign policy of European Union or whole, or at least policy towards Eastern Europe of the European Union and so on and so forth. Why Ukraine, for example, uh, in these years was sometimes much more reliant on relations uh, with France and Germany than Poland. But uh, now, in 2022, all that has changed. And now, actually, the cooperation between Poland and Ukraine uh, 
due to the work, due to this effort, due to this destruction, due to these challenges, which actually change both the security perception, not only in our region and between our states, but in whole uh, Europe and democratic countries in particular, this gives us a chance to actually come to a strategic per, uh, partnership. And I think it's uh, not uh, strange at all that when we thinking about a new treaty between other countries, we try to model it on a French uh, a German uh, example, although it's, let's say, quite old, but the idea is uh, actually the same. Uh, to uh, connect the societies, to connect both states institutionally, so that to create a certain regional dynamic and a certain regional power. Then it was inside the Western Europe, now it's the idea uh, inside the Central Europe. So I stay very optimistic about uh, our relations right now, and I think we are having quite a historical chance, and I wish all of us success. Thank you very much. Uh, on a very positive note, and uh, right now um, I would ask Łukasz Adamski. I'm a bit tired today, you understand why? I'm going to speak in Ukrainian, is going to to speak in Ukrainian about these relations. If we just look, what has changed a lot, the most in our relations during the last year, first of all, but also I would say maybe three years. Many people have been working on the improvement of these relations. Some of them are here in this room. That's the restoration of trust and even acquisition of huge trust from each other. I remember uh, somebody already mentioned that I have been working with Polish-Ukrainian uh, relations for a long time. Several years ago, there was a statement that that what we lack the most is trust, trust in each other. And uh, much too often we we get into this emotional spiral. Now this trust is there. And uh, honestly, I can tell you that I cannot even imagine a situation which would serve more as a crash test for Polish-Ukrainian relations than the war, than the threat, existential threat uh, for the being of the whole state. And here we found out that uh, Poland is, doesn't just have any hostile intentions towards Ukraine, doesn't want uh, to cooperate with the axis of evil with Orban and Putin because there was this evil axis of evil. Even some journalists commented that probably the trajectory of Polish-Ukrainian relations logically leads to the fact that Poland is going to be together with Russia, uh, will be concluding some anti-Ukrainian alliance. Several years ago, even famous people re uh, reiterated that. Uh, but uh, what uh, Mikhail Gruszewski said in 1906, and he was the first, but uh, it's not there. There is this huge trust. And we see this trust among politicians, among diplomats. We see this trust in the society as well. Uh, recently, my institution, the Miroshevsky Center, uh, in cooperation with Ukrainian sociological search info sapiens, a survey of public opinion among Ukrainians about Poland and Poles, their attitude to Poland and Poles. Well, what we found, first of all, there isn't a more popular politician in Ukraine than Andrzej Duda. He got better results than Biden did. Well, that was in November, though. <laughs> but I still think that uh, that here uh, it's going to be healthier competition between them now. Secondly, we saw that uh, Ukrainian positive attitude towards Poles is the highest if compared to other nations. I'm going to quote some numbers from my head, but these results are also there on our website. And here in the materials of this event, maybe many of you have already taken these uh, results. If 
uh, Ukrainian sociologist asked, like, what's your attitude to Poland? It was, I think, 83%. It was positive. As for negative, less than 0.5. So we can say it's almost zero. Uh, just to compare about Germans, 44% people are positive and 4% are negative. There is a difference, right? As for Russians, 88% are negative or very negative and 1.5% are positive. Another survey. Attitude of Ukrainians, I'll say it differently. Which culture, which Ukrainian nation, European nation seems uh, attractive to you? Which culture is attractive for you? It turns out that Polish culture uh, ranked first. It turned out to be in total. There were more answers than about British, Italian or French. I mean, that's also something that really surprises. I don't even know how to describe it in short, but it's just it illustrates this huge demand for uh, finding out more about Poles and Poland. I can also say that Ukrainians also wanted maybe to see more Polish films, Polish books. As far as I remember, 72% supported the idea that the Ukrainian schools, Ukrainian students uh, don't study the poems by Pushkin, but instead uh, read more about uh, Adam Mickiewicz, who was the biggest Polish poet of the time, but he was also a political scientist, by, by the way, uh, because uh, in his works, Mickiewicz uh, diagnosed Russian society and Russian political system extremely well. I could continue about other surveys because as far as I remember, 18% of Ukrainians uh, admitted that they have relatives among uh, uh, Poles in Halicina that was 33%. That means that there are even family connections or memory of these connections, memory of kin. Uh, and now I'll move to the threats. But in this situation, when in Poland, there is uh, one and a half, two or three, four even million Ukrainians. Nobody knows for sure because it is hard to calculate. Uh, it's just the people who officially reside uh, in Poland but periodically uh, travel to Ukraine like to, play, uh, like to visit their parents or play in the staged productions. So what significance will it have that several tens of thousands of Ukrainian uh, kids will go to Polish schools. All these refugees, the immigration, the migrants are going to speak uh, fluently or more or less fluently to Polish. They will come back to Ukraine, but with this cultural potential, uh, the knowledge about Poland, what kind of consequences it's going to have? Honestly, I believe that it is hard to imagine even what's going to happen because the history, I don't know any example. so that this, there were these close connections between two nations. And here again, and there is a huge example that our language and, and cultures are very close and uh, two or three months are enough for Ukrainians to speak Polish and to understand everything and vice versa as well. Uh, so we saw that uh, Polish participants of the conference, they don't require any translation from uh, Ukrainian. As for threats, uh, for me, uh, well, that's a chance. As I said, there's the huge capital of trust and uh, sympathy, and we have to use it. We already have to promote it. We have to use it. In which form? Uh, but again, most Ukrainians would want to have some Polish-Ukrainian union or commonwealth. Uh, happy with the way our relations look now. Uh, this uh, neighborhood model, that's just the minority, 40%. Most would like to have a format like between Sweden and Norway uh, or like Sweden and Denmark. But instead, a, a threat. For me, the first threat is that, I'll be frank here, but Poland is much richer now than Ukraine. 
and uh, Ukraine is at, this, at war. And uh, if this huge uh, Ukrainian immigration to Poland, uh, the refugees to Poland, uh, if most of them decide to stay in Poland, this means this means brain drain from Ukraine. This means that uh, Ukrainian young people or the most active society members are going to connect their future not with Ukraine, but that's going to be reconstructed after the war, after the victory, but with Poland. E and uh, I'm not suggesting that uh, this threat is really imminent, but uh, from the point of view of Ukraine and uh, Poland, it would be good for the major part of the migrants to come back to Ukraine. How we should uh, make this possible, facilitate that uh, is still a question because we do not know how long uh, this war uh, will last. But this is a challenge in its own right and should be recognized as such. I am uh, turning the floor to Mikhailo Drabak. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, first, uh, I would like to focus on more general perspective of our relations. Uh, I uh, 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 on, during the previous uh, panels, uh, the uh, global uh, perspective of our relations was discussed, but we cannot uh, escape from this issue. Uh, today, the security of and political stability of Central Europe and, and the whole Europe uh, depends on uh, how successful Ukraine will be uh, in its fight uh, against the uh, Russian aggressor. And uh, this struggle uh, oh, could be uh, uh, this struggle is impossible without Polish uh, participation and help. But also, we should think about uh, uh, further steps. Uh, when this war is, will be over, uh, this threat will not be over. <laughs> Uh, this threat will be uh, uh, there, and uh, we should understand how how to live in this uh, in this turbulent uh, uh, environment and this turbulent world. And uh, we also, I guess, uh, as uh, we are not only neighbors, we are natural allies, and we uh, should uh, uh, overcome uh, the, the such uh, risks uh, together. Uh, current events give Ukraine and Poland uh, a kind of new political role within the EU and Europe in general. Uh, for years, uh, what, I'm, uh, what I mean, uh, for years, Ukrainian and Polish uh, politicians, uh, experts, elites uh, had been warning their European counterparts about the dangers of uh, trade relations with Russia or uh, about the gen dangers of Russian information octopus. Uh, for years, representatives of uh, both states had been uh, speaking about the need for a more uh, consistent and decisive uh, EU approach to the uh, 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 European uh, to the EU neighborhood policy and about providing several European states, particularly Ukraine, um, with a clear plan for uh, joining the EU. And only Russian invasion convinced many politicians in Europe that uh, uh, these uh, ideas made sense and uh, Poland and Ukraine were right. Uh, these processes uh, partly uh, influence uh, the fact that today some kind of symbolic credibility of, of Ukraine and Poland uh, uh, arise among uh, uh, some Western, uh, Western European politicians and elites. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, the uh, political and security weight of, of, of Poland and Ukraine uh, uh, is changing, is growing. Uh, uh, these circumstances, as well as uh, Russian aggression and future global turbulence, uh, require the two states uh, to accelerate and scale up cooperation, uh, not only in military industrial sphere, but uh, also in uh, exchanging intelligence data, countering hard and hybrid threats, as well as building comprehensive resilience of states and societies. Uh, we cannot escape from securitization of our relation. 
relations, and and uh, that's uh, that's my main main point. Uh, of course, uh, we are on the highest point, uh, on the highest level of our uh, bilateral relations in our history uh, because of circumstances, but because of, of, of the trust uh, uh, that Lukas mentioned also. Uh, but uh, we uh, should um, should be aware that uh, we need some some uh, ambitious uh, projects to be implemented, uh, uh, some ambitious projects in, in security, in, in, uh, in infrastructure, and, and, and so on, in social issues uh, for uh, ensuring the uh, social and political and security stability of the region. Uh, we uh, are as a main, like, not main forces in the region, but, but the mm, two actors that are, are caring the most about values in the region, uh, European values, about uh, our common values, about the values of democracy, freedom, and, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, we should be aware of our role uh, on, on, on ensuring the uh, security and, 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 and uh, prosperity and stability. So that is why we need some set of, 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 of uh, priorities uh, in, in our uh, bilateral relations in terms of, of practical projects. Uh, we need some kind of, of, uh, uh, of implementation of a game changer uh, idea. Uh, for example, in, in infrastructure, what will, what, uh, will, which will um, connect Ukraine more with the European uh, uh, system with, with Europe, with European uh, 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 countries, and uh, I, I guess that uh, such project may be uh, uh, like um, it, it could be a Euro track between uh, the uh, Polish railway network and Ukrainian Ukrainian railway ne network. Uh, for example, we ha have this idea of connecting two capitals, Warsaw and Kyiv, with the Eurotrack, uh, 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 Eurotrack, uh, and uh, but uh, still we have uh, uh, no idea how to implement this project. But I guess that uh, uh, bearing in mind that uh, the uh, the political and uh, and uh, and security. Uh, uh, position of, of Ukraine and Poland is changing, we can attract more uh, attention of other uh, actors, for example, EU or, or some other countries, uh, attract their attention and attract their resources for implementing such, such, uh, uh, such projects. And also, as a final remark in this uh, uh, session, I uh, would mention that uh, uh, as all, all, all the previous speakers said that uh, uh, Ukrainian and Polish societies currently have uh, the, strong, the strongest sympathies, uh, maybe, in uh, their history for each other, and uh, we have also strong ties with each other. Uh, we should use this and uh, we should enhance this with um, uh, creating uh, more platforms for closer cooperation between uh, scientists, uh, experts, municipalities, uh, youth, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, this development, uh, in, in practical terms, I mean development, uh, uh, development of horizontal ties uh, uh, will uh, strengthen interaction at different levels uh, between our countries countries and uh, will increase opportunities uh, uh, for, for, for cooperation in future. Uh, at the same time with uh, this, uh, both states will have, a, uh, will have a very wide field for solving, um, solving common uh, issues, solving common problems and uh, for uh, innovations that we need. We, we need to uh, make uh, innovations in this turbulent world to be competitive, but we can do it, uh, I guess, only with each, with each other. Uh, at, the same time, at the same time, the development of horizontal ties between uh, Ukraine and, and, and Polish, uh, Ukraine and Poland uh, uh, can be additional ground for attracting uh, Polish investments uh, in Ukraine uh, uh, after the war, the war will be over and uh, the uh, renovation, restoration of Ukraine will, will start. Uh, and also, um, and this is the final uh, sentence, right. uh, also, uh, um, Development of, of horizontal ties between uh, uh, Ukrainian and Polish societies, uh, in practical terms, will also be a, an additional instrument for Ukrainian society and Ukrainian state to keep ties with Ukrainians who are in Poland. 
uh, Ukrainian refugees who are in Poland, it's important uh, uh, because uh, um, uh, the war is uh, going more than a year, and uh, these people are just m m m uh, they are maybe ex expressing more uh, uh, intention to to uh, stay in Poland for longer time. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to all the speakers for uh, f for a very thorough and um, uh, thorough and wide uh, presentation of the. Uh, processes that that um, that influence the uh, future of polish ukrainian uh, relations i mean we had a very wide range of uh, of topics and of uh, of subjects i mean from security and infrastructure to to two issues of uh, our societies and um, and identities um, before we go to uh, before we go to the questions from the audience i would uh, like to ask you one more um, uh, one more question Namely, uh, all of you have been touched upon this a bit in uh, in your um, uh, in your uh, presentations. But what uh, I mean, we clearly see that there is a momentum. We clearly see that there is a path uh, path forward. Uh, what challenges? I mean, can influence that? What challenges should we keep in mind? Um, except those, I mean, which were already mentioned. I mean. Uh, we should keep in mind while moving forward, and also uh, what can be, which also was something which also was partially already mentioned. I mean, what can be the structure, the substance of uh, moving our uh, uh, our relations, moving the Polish-Ukrainian relations forward, and what could be the role of this process uh, in this process? What could be the role of uh, Poland support for Ukrainian reforms, especially in the context of uh, Ukraine's um, European integration. And uh, same order. So uh, first, I would ask uh, Asiat Vigorogoro. Thanks, and I can start with a little maybe argument with Wukash, <laughs> so that it's more interesting. Um, uh, oh, sure, you, you, in due order, uh, uh, because I think that. Uh, uh, the greatest challenge between our partnership, brotherhood, is not the war. The war unites us because we have a common enemy. We've always had this common enemy. So in this term, it's easier to uh, join forces in many respects. Uh, I think the challenge will be post-war. I, I, I believe Ukraine is going to win this war, but the challenge will be post-war cooperation, for example, between uh, within the European Union at some point, uh, when we will have to get into different disputes over diverging interests of Polish agricultural sector and Ukrainian agricultural sector, etc., etc. So I think uh, this is going to be a challenge. And this assertiveness I was talking about, which I think is a great feature assertiveness and pride in their own country, it can also have these aspects that are going to make Ukraine a difficult partner, less inclined to compromise, uh, and uh, maybe um, expecting more than, than possible. Uh, let's have a look at this uh, EU integration process. Generally, it's a long, mundane, boring process with many legal aspects. And I, uh, I have an impression that in Ukraine it is seen as a, like, this victorious uh, 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 adventure, you know, that you are rewarded with this uh, for war merits. Uh, and in fact, it, it has a different nature, very complicated and very uh, mundane. Uh, and and uh, in these terms, uh, I think it's, it's, it's rightly for Ukraine to demand this, uh, this candidate status and now the, the, the um, the membership, but uh, Ukraine has to be uh, has to be ready to adapt to to all the expectations because this is what we have done we did before in the past. And second thing, second challenge is of course history, history which is a part of identity. And I don't think history is like uh, vital for most Ukrainians when the war is still going on and, and uh, uh, you know, you have much more vital interests uh, and, and needs. But generally, uh, as part of this identity which, which is changing, Ukraine is just 
completing its, its, its uh, identity building process, nation building process. Uh, so it's a very Ukrainian oriented identity with a glorification of historic heroes, which is understandable, obviously. But on the other hand, uh, you know, this uh, uh, figures, historic figures that became mainstream in Ukraine are uh, controversial in Poland. This is also a very well-known fact, yes. And I know that Stepan Bandera, which is a symbol for Poland and symbol for Ukraine, it's a symbolic figure, uh, I think disputes are ahead. Uh, because uh, uh, the, one of the processes in Ukraine, the identity processes, is that uh, Bandera today is a hero not only for Western Ukraine, but for whole of Ukraine. His uh, popularity increased four times since 2012, uh, ten, within the last 10 years. So he's the hero of all Ukraine, but why is he a hero? Because he's a f symbol of fighting Russia, the, this eternal enemy. Uh, for in Poland, he's seen primarily uh, in terms of different atrocities that uh, that the uh, Ukrainian insurgent army, the UPA, did. Of course, he was not personally involved in that because he was in the German camp. But generally, this is a subject to be discussed and a challenge for both of our countries. For Ukraine, it's a challenge to uh, to kind of proceed from this glorification uh, for nation for, for nation building purposes, from glorification to a more nuanced approach to national heroes, and for Poland, it's a challenge of understanding that uh, that Ukrainian insurgent army and Bandera and and Trukhevich and other people were not just anti-Polish uh, 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 activists. Uh, first of all, in Ukraine, they are seen as uh, as anti-Russian. Uh, uh, fighters and fighters for Ukrainian independence. So, so that also has to be admitted in Poland. So I think uh, we have a lot of uh, disputes ahead, not only in those two spheres that I mentioned. All right, thank you. And I now pass the floor to Nadia Koval. Uh, uh, thank you. For me, probably uh, the identity challenges uh, that Yadviga was uh, talking about are less important because these challenges um, they pertain mostly to bilateral relations and with a certain amount of goodwill uh, on the both sides uh, to treat and uh, um, actually resolve these questions, I think we can work on this in the post-war situation. For me personally, currently, uh, what is the biggest challenge now, both for these relations and to the uh, region in general, are actually the external challenges, uh, those challenges that we do not have such a direct um, influence on. Because both Poland and Ukraine are rather medium-sized countries, which exist in a certain regional environment with stronger, bigger, and many different uh, partners. And for me personally, two factors would be the most important for the future of Ukrainian-Polish relations. First would be how uh, the European Union will uh, evolve in the future, because we have a war, we have a major war. These uh, things always change the balance of power in the region. Uh, they change uh, the usual uh, development of events. Jadwiga has uh, mentioned that, of course, if everything goes as planned, uh, we might have in the future uh, something like, um, I don't say conflict, but probably issues on some questions like agriculture and so on and so forth. But still, uh, there is a more structural questions in the EU like how much centralized the EU would be, how much actually it would be symmetrical or symmetry, how will be the foreign policy decision taken there, uh, because all of this limits very much the possibilities of other countries. And the second uh, and even more uh, important question is actually how this war will end. Of course, we all believe in Ukraine's victory, and, but still uh, Russia is still strong. Uh, it is still not vanquished. Uh, it still has some allies. We still very critically depends, or depend on Western help, first of all, military help. And in the unlikely event that it will finish one moment, this victory is not 100% uh, sure. And uh, we still have very many partners around the world who have this conciliatory attitude towards Russia, who would like to force like dialogue a concession upon us. And 
there is a hypothetical situation that we might find ourselves in a situation when our like, bilateral uh, possibilities for developing relations will be somehow limited. So I don't want to picture something very, very drastic, but uh, just to point that now we have this unique chance, now we can develop our relations both uh, politically, militarily, uh, in a way that indeed has already changed many perceptions, already has changed uh, uh, known balances of power influence in their region. And still we should be aware that we still have some important limitations just to know how to work with them. All right, thank you very much. And now, Łukasz Adamski. So, uh, I promise you an, an uh, element of polemic, so I will do it. Jadwiga, so I haven't said that war is a challenge for Polish-Ukrainian relations. I said that uh, migration and uh, refugees, migration caused by the war and refugees, uh, Ukrainian immigration to Poland, and uh, if uh, most of them will not return, that would be a challenge. That would be a challenge since uh, Ukraine needs those people, and, uh, and Poland needs, on the one hand, strong Ukraine, and on the other hand, Poland also needs people who will be working in Poland, uh, who will uh, replace somehow the demographic gap which we have. And the problem is that uh, Ukraine is, is in an even worse situation. So I would not say that war, of course war paradoxically is a chance, since as, as I said, war uh, caused a huge confidence to each other, but uh, this migration, if they will stay, if most of them will stay in Poland. And the second challenge is, of course, the difference in and the living standards, and the level of the economic development. If you look at at such a popular, well-known indicator as GDP, purchasing power parity, then between Germany and Poland, uh, the difference is like 1.5 to 1. And between Poland and Ukraine probably is now 3 to 1, and if the war will not end soon, then this gap can only increase. And this would be, you know, a huge vacuum that would, uh, would again, um, pump up uh, the most uh, productive uh, people from, from Ukraine. And this is what I am I'm afraid of. And as to the history, of course, history is important since history generates uh, emotions. And uh, what is the price for um, not managing emotions in a successful way? Uh, then we saw uh, some years ago under the uh, rule of the previous Ukraine's president, Mr. Poroshenko. But uh, on the other hand, I think in the long term, and not even Bandera issue uh, will be an obstacle. I. I perfectly understand why uh, Stepan Bandera became now a, a memo in Ukraine. I don't like it, but I uh, understand the reasons, and I think many people in Poland also understand. I hope that uh, in the Ukrainian history, uh, Ukra uh, that Ukraine will find uh, many other persons who would who would be who were much more talented politicians than Stepan Bandera. Stepan Bandera was not a talented politician. But anyway, uh, if we look at, uh, at, uh, at history, I think paradoxically that uh, in the long term, uh, a bigger danger is from the idea of colonialism, which was mentioned by Jadwiga. Uh, it's not a secret that Timothy Snyder started, for example, to disseminate a view that Ukraine was a part of colonial empires of Poland and Russia. And I can tell you that uh, one eminent uh, Ukrainian scholar, a historian, and a rector of Ukrainian university, university when uh, she heard it, she's, uh, she was simply furious and said that it is a, it is a um, misinterpretation of history 
at Ukrainian or ancestors of today's Ukrainian people, Ruthenians in the old Commonwealth uh, were one of the um, free political nations. Uh, then uh, Ruthenians had even their own kings, like uh, Michał Korybut Wisniewiecki, Mihailo Wisniewiecki, so that uh, what uh, that the idea that uh, the old Commonwealth was a colonial empire is a, a distortion of uh, every evidence-based uh, narrative of history which she knows, and she proposed even to 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 organize this co a conference, a special conference of eminent Polish and Ukrainian scholars, uh, which is devoted to this idea. But I see that due to the due to the um, process of de-imperialization, or to be honest, de-Russification of Ukraine, uh, both in the Ukraine and in the West, from, for various reasons, this uh, concept of decolonialization de was chosen. And if uh, we already deal with such um, term, then I'm afraid it can be quite uh, easy to to present um, the history of Ukraine in a really distorted way. So, um, for me, this, this, this would be the, the, the real danger when it comes to Polish-Ukrainian relations. Poland was not, did not occupy Ukraine and Poland did not colonize Ukraine. All right, and now Mikhailo Drapak. The problem of answering the last is that all the options has already been used. It's always a challenge. Yeah, but uh, okay, I will uh, try to add something, <laughs> uh, some some new perspective or additional perspective on on on, on the, the mentioned issues. I also uh, believe that. Uh, uh, the European integration of Ukraine will be uh, and access into the EU will be a challenge for our bilateral relations, but n not uh, only in in uh, in terms of negotiations, uh, in accession negotiations. Uh, you know, every country of of, of of the European Union or or every country in the Central uh, uh, European part of European Union uh, uh, was passing through this and uh, passed through this and uh, it's 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 normal process so I think we will uh, overcome it but uh, the other problem is that um, uh, the European Union uh, uh, after the um, uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukraine's accession and, and Moldova's accession uh, will be another uh, uh, political union. It will be another uh, union with uh, another uh, uh, with other uh, rules and uh, maybe other principles in uh, of 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 its function uh, and uh, its uh, power. So uh, it may be a, a challenge for for our bilateral relations, uh, but n not in terms of. Like, there is no direct uh, risk, I, I guess, but uh, there is a, a risk that uh, uh, Poland, as a member of the EU, uh, in discussions with other members of, of the EU, will uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, get some, some, some stance uh, that will not be uh, perceived in Ukraine as, as, as good towards Ukraine. So uh, that, that may be a, a problem. Uh, another issue is that uh, the uh, success of, of rebuilding Ukraine after the war uh, will determine also our bilateral relations. I mean that Ukraine need, be, uh, need to be a, 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 an equal partner in economic terms, in, in social terms, uh, for uh, for uh, uh, effective uh, bilateral cooperation, and uh, 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 and the economic success of Ukraine and the uh, success of, of, of rebuilding Ukraine will uh, influence the bilateral relations, uh, and also I, I guess that. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, history is also uh, on the table as as a problematic issue, uh, uh, but uh, uh, it's a common problem for for all uh, for all the region of Central Europe. Every country of Central Europe, uh, maybe with few uh, uh, exceptions, uh, they have uh, some some issues uh, on history in their bilateral relations, uh, but. The problem with history is not with pro problem with history. It's a problem of, of, of uh, perception of history by societies. Uh, but we need to understand, and we, we should be aware that uh, uh, every 
uh, every new event in our in, in our history uh, it uh, makes and creates new new uh, new perspective uh, through which uh, society uh, uh, look on 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 on, on, uh, on uh, history that is why i think that ukraine and, and poland they created uh, these years they are creating new perspective for uh, for perception of, of for public perception of history uh, and uh, I, I i think that uh, this uh, issue will be on the table but it will not be so problematic as it was before and in this uh, as example i may uh, 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 I may consider uh, words of, of Andrzej Duda, uh, which he said uh, during the commemoration of victims of uh, Volin tragedy, uh, tragedy uh, last summer. Uh, uh, he said that uh, uh, Poland and Polish citizens should be aware that uh, uh, somebody of, 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 uh, of them, uh, of, of those uh, who, whom Ukrainians are calling uh, heroes, they may be uh, heroes and, uh, uh, in some circumstances, but uh, Ukrainians also should be aware that in other circum circumstances uh, they could be not heroes at all. So. All right. Uh Thank you very much. We're actually a bit ahead of time. Uh, and um, because of that, I mean, I think that there is a room for, um, for questions from the audience. Uh, but before we proceed to the questions from the audience, I just have a small, um, a small announcement that after this uh, discussion panel, there still will be a short presentation uh, from Ambassador uh, Chichotsky. Um, so you can, uh, after the end of the panel, it's not the end of the event. You can stay. Uh, you can stay for just few, uh, for some time longer. And now I guess we have time for the first uh, first question. Go ahead. Um, I'm. I have the following question: uh, If war ends tomorrow, um, um, back to business uh, will be a topical uh, thing. And part of the back to business uh, notion would be uh, talking to Russia, talking to Russians, and about Russia in the West. Uh, so um, um, I have been, you know, I was participate uh, participate in, in in some endeavors of this kind as we, I was running the Center for Polish Russian Dialogue and Understanding, and after 2014 particularly uh, German um, uh, foundations uh, were very eager to uh, uh, to kind of um, uh, moderate discussion between Ukrainians and the Russians or uh, uh, try to how uh, to you know reconcile these two societies my question to the panelists would be do you think that uh, under this back to business mood, uh, Poles and Ukrainians should engage into this kind of uh, exercises together, or rather, act uh, separately. I mean, talking about Russia and the Russians uh, on bilateral basis, or rather, uh, talk to the Germans on on Russia on bilateral basis. Or rather, they should try to join forces and and uh, talk to uh, our Western uh, counterparts and to the Russians together. So, how what your recommendation uh, recommendation would be? Thank you. All right. So, I suggest maybe uh, in the questions we could go in the reverse order. Uh, so, uh, I would ask Mihailo Drapak. Well. Um, from my side, the answer will be short. Will be short. Um, when the war will be over, I guess uh, the Russian threat will not be over. That is why we will have uh, this uh, common feeling of, of, of common threat, and that is why we will keep this uh, this uh, like bilateral uh, position on, on on Russia, and we will be uh, appealing with with. Uh, uh, we will be appealing about Russian threat to uh, uh, Germans and to other uh, uh, European forces. That's 
Так, коли говорити про Росію, то краще українською. When you talk about Russia, it's better to do it in Ukrainian. You know what? Actually, the question is a very good question, but it's... Is whether the dominating view is the same or there is different. Uh, and uh, what I'm basing it on is that we have a lot of common interest and a lot of common vision. That's true. But there are also nuances. There are nuances because uh, Ukraine is at war with Russia. And I mean, of course, it uh, uh, yields radicalization of views. And uh, like what to do with Russia and whether Poland is is going to support that idea of real federalization or, ex or for example, the disintegration of federation. Uh, but Uh, in Ukraine, it very often it works, that question. The question is also what to do with the place of Russia, with the seat of Russian Security Council, I answer that question. The question, what kind of strategy would adopt about the Russian opposition? That's the question. And Poland, you have to say, is rather radical here, and we believe that this is not just Putin's war. This is also Russian, uh, the war of Russia and Russians. And most Russians support Putin and support the war, or at least uh, don't publicly, or even non publicly, uh, express their readiness to condemn it. So, about Russia and Russians, we have to use the same uh, approach that we had towards Germans and the world after World War II. So, uh, like Karl Gaspar said about the German guilt, there's something you should read. Uh, there is uh, criminal and also the society, there is a moral uh, one, also the society, Russian society, but, but I also see some nuances already in Poland because we have been for Alexei Navalny for his fight against Putin's regime, we understood that sometimes certain statements which here in Ukraine were condemned, he said like about the Crimea, uh, through the strategy, uh, through working with the electorate, with the Putinists, and what we actually value, what is that on behalf of Navalny, there were the statements that territorial integrity of Ukraine has to be brought back. Uh, so this means that Crimea should also come back to Ukraine. And here in Ukraine, I have heard very often, Navalny is not Putin's agent, this is just this national is just like Putin, so what's the difference? So I mean, that's just illustrations, because I want to say that there are, there is a certain difference in the approach. And that is clear. I analyze. And this means that I would say the, the recommendation would be, of course, yeah, it would be good if Poles and Ukrainians, like people who used to be very experienced in Russian imperialism, just like many, many, uh, there were many wars that they fought together against Moscow. I think it was 13, 14, yes. Starting from uh, the war uh, of Sepan Batory, who was actually the founder of uh, Registered Cossacks. Maybe uh, some Kiev street should be remained because he is the founder of Registered Cossacks and, uh, and uh, defeated Ivan Krozny. Uh, I mean, we had that experience. And uh, that experience of fighting against Russia, the experience how all we together will live through that and what is our understanding of the point? Russian policy, yes. All this experience uh, that has to be promoted in the West or in other countries. But again, I wouldn't appeal here to some automatic things because 
I mean, we are two sovereign states, and in certain issues we might have a separate opinion, but I'll repeat myself. I mean, the last thing that I'm going to say, and that's clear, because the war always spurs this, how should I say, emotions that Ukrainian emotional voice is going to have big influence on Western politicians, on Western public opinion, Polish voice, which can it can be less emotional, but we're still not we're not sitting under Russian bombs. At least most Poles are not. Those that are here, they are. Yeah, and uh, sometimes it's different, but it also means that we can achieve the synergy together, even if uh, uh, there are no certain messages that we repeat. But again, uh, I think that this result is going to be good. And in the Yakov. The war in 2017, 2018, 19, there was a certain pilgrimage of different initiatives, both supported by German foundations, by some American organization, by some international organization. Actually, there was a, a real bunch of plans uh, why Eastern Europe, including Ukraine, should be a buffer, a gray security zone. Why is it a compromise solution that will help us to um, resolve this security crisis or Ukrainian crisis we've been witnessing since 2014. It, it was uh, indeed very, very difficult to, uh, to talk with people to explain why uh, this is not what uh, we are actually expecting. And it was always uh, that there were participants from different countries, but mostly these were Ukrainians who were against and they were lonely. And uh, the answer to your question, mine is very simple. Yes, of course, we should do this together. We understand, for example, that even in the um, experience of the foreign policy of Poland, there were different approaches toward Russia. Sometimes that were more conflict. Sometimes they were quite engaging. Sometimes that they were like more in line with European priorities, sometimes less. But I think that this uh, war has really so much shifted the security perception both in Poland and probably, probably after this war, even this uh, German, American and other foundations will come with a bit different plans. Of course, there will be plans uh, of re-engaging Russia, of reconciliation of Russia and Ukraine after the war and so on and so forth. And I think not to be lonely, I think it's in both of our interests would be to act together. Thank you. All right, thank you. And Jadwiga uh, together and separately depending what we want to achieve and i think uh, i will agree with lukas here more <laughs> this time because i think that w the, in our best interest will be to shape uh, uh to shape european views on that and we can see that no things are predetermined uh that it's really it's it's us Poles that were seen as biased by Germans, by French uh, years ago, biased towards Russia, Russophobic, and today we are in the mainstream. And it, it's a process of very painful and slow uh, change of mindset of Germany, first of all, uh, on Russia. It takes time, but it's, it's going on. It, it has started. So I think uh, building coalitions within EU uh, with different partners, with our obvious partners like the Baltic states, with maybe less obvious partners so far like Czech Republic, is vital for persuading uh, the, the old Europe, if you, if you like, although <laughs> it's a notion of the past, I think, uh, to, uh, to uh, really uh, exclude Russia uh, uh, for for good from different uh, from different uh, frameworks, not only security frameworks, but also energy uh, cooperation. But it should be uh, just uh, temp uh, permanently excluded from different. Uh, and we need arguments, not emotional, not radical. We need uh, 
very practical, pragmatic arguments why it is better for all of us. So I think uh, it's better to create these pragmatic coalitions, uh, okay. also for the sake of Ukraine's uh, future, just because we think we have in mind this uh, this aim of uh, of permanently excluding Russia from our vision of, of, of the world, from, you know, the fact that uh, Germany was using Russia as a source of its uh, internal domestic uh, economic development. It should no longer be, uh, be the case. So I think uh, the work within EU is, is, is yet to come. All right, thank you very much. And I've seen last time a question there in, uh, in the back, a raised hand, yes. Thank you. Uh, speaking of migration, uh, this is a very interesting case when there is also a kind of, at the same time, crisis and an opportunity. Uh, crisis, I mean, obvious, I mean, tragedy of millions of people from Ukraine having to migrate to save their lives uh, to neighboring Poland and uh, further uh, to other members of the European Union. On the other hand, uh, it's an opportunity uh, in many ways. I mean, it's better awareness of the societies and uh, uh, and actually this is maybe the first time since I don't know for many years that it seems like those migrants are welcome in Europe not only in Poland but also in other countries of the Euro of Europe uh, Ukrainian migrants are considered really positively this is uh, this is interesting change of perception and uh, that that's absolutely different from previous enlargements, even when, when we talk about even when Poland was entering the European Union uh, or other countries, uh, like now Western Balkan countries, candidate countries. Migration was always very, and still is very difficult issue to, to debate. Now it seems like Ukrainian migration to EU, EU seems to be perceived differently. So the question is, uh, still, I mean, those people in, uh, Ukrainians in European Union member states, in Poland and others, are now enjoying temporary protection status. For, correct me, I mean, it's one and a half year or two years. So the question is that it's temporary. And, but we understand that not all of them will come back. And the question is whether actually we'll, we'll need to force them to come back. Probably it will be not a good solution neither for Ukraine nor for, for the European Union member states. Rather, a win-win solution would be to find probably a lasting solution for this, lasting regulation. So is it possible to think, maybe in Poland, have you ever, ever started a discussion in Poland of a lasting solution for Ukrainian migra migrants to regulate this migration? As a, we now have this framework of candidate status, so joining the European Union, so it could be considered as a, uh, part of integration to the single market for freedoms. Has such a discussion started in Poland or maybe you have already examples in other member states? Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And I guess we'll go the same order as last time. So I'll ask uh, uh, Mikhail Drapak to, uh, to answer the question as, as the first. It's very hard to answer this question now to find a solution before the war is over and before the um, Ukraine obtain uh, before Ukraine obtain the security guarantees because without security guarantees and without uh, security uh, security environment uh, enough security environment in Ukraine uh, we cannot uh, speak about uh, um, returning of migrants. So that, that's the first issue. Uh, another issue, I would say that, rather I would agree that majority of people will not come back because the, the more uh, war is, is lasting, the more, uh, the biggest, the bigger number is. Uh, so uh, here, uh, the solution may be like, to, to keep ties with those people, to 
attract them after after some time maybe and to attract them as as investors maybe uh, in, in in ukrainian economy as uh, n now we can see that uh, uh, ukrainians in in poland are uh, one of the uh, most active uh, economic group uh, they are found in uh, enterprises and they are boosting the uh, polish economy uh, they may become investors in Ukrainian economy after war, but uh, uh, it's it's really difficult question from the uh, perspective of, of Ukrainian side. Uh, I would say that uh, the first thing is to keep ties from the Ukrainian state and st Ukrainian society. The second thing is to create uh, environment uh, for these people to come back uh, as, as as many people as we uh, can return. Uh, as to Poland, uh, even before the war, it was quite easy to, for Ukrainians to, um, to find job in Poland and to immigrate. And now uh, I think uh, as long as the war goes on, nobody would, uh, of course, uh, change the status of Ukrainian citizens in the EU. So they will uh, be protected b uh, by uh, generally, yeah. and they, uh, they will be given generally uh, further the status of, uh, of migrants. Um, no, of, of course, the question is uh, what would happen uh, after the war and what uh, legal solution will the EU uh, then uh, implement? I don't have the deep knowledge in this area, so I, I, I can't predict. And, uh, what I can say is that probably uh, Irrespectively of the general solu solutions adopted on the EU level, uh, every country would uh, be able to regulate the sphere also on the national level. And I'm quite sure that uh, Poland would uh, remain a country which is open for Ukrainian migrants. And, and perhaps uh, I will also turn your attention to the fact that this migration, of course, it, 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 it might be obvious, but it, it should be also here uh, said that this migration is, uh, is very specific. It's predominantly women. Men have to remain in Ukraine. But Ukrainian women can, uh, f uh, can travel free and enjoy all privileges of the EU uh, common market. Uh, what, what impact it would have? Mm, no, we'll see. But uh, as I said earlier, I'm. I think that this um, that that possible situation where most Ukrainian migrants, women migrants, will not return to Ukraine, it would be um, dangerous for Ukraine itself. Oh, thank you. I don't have a concrete answer. I don't know the plans of the Polish government how to resolve this um, uh, issue in the long term. So the only thing I would like to note is actually that migration is extremely important in Polish-Ukrainian relations. Be before the war, before the way of refugees, there was a very important way of Ukrainian work migration to Poland. And when we did another research on mutual perception of Ukrainians and Poles a few years before the war, it was very visible that the contents of how the two peoples perceive each other is in the uh, large way defined by this migration. Most of the contacts between Poles and Ukrainians happen in the, on the territory of Poland and uh, between people who are in a bit different societal situations. Yes, and it influences both perception, for example, like Poles uh, are perceived as uh, uh, much uh, richer and well-off people, Ukrainians are perceived as a poor people coming for works and so on and so forth. And uh, this uh, migration, or it's not migration, it's now actually this refugee wave, it adds even another layer. And now our previous research has shown that actually uh, the two peoples have very little knowledge about the state and the culture of each other. Now that so many migrants start, uh, as Lukas mentioned, going to school in Poland, for example, Ukrainians have much better chance to learn what Poland is, what Polish culture is, and so on and so forth. And this is not reciprocated for the moment. Yes, Poles for, for uh, very, um, 
obvious reasons, do not go to Ukraine and do not have the chance to know the Ukrainian state and culture. So I think uh, in the longer run, it will be also a, a challenge, adding to the challenge of brain drain we were already treating. Yeah, I don't have much to add. Uh, I think no decisions are made as yet uh, in the government, but I don't can see uh, any like coercive measures taken to uh, to like withdraw all the statuses uh, given to to refugees. Uh, the identification numbers given to them uh, simplify the future legalization uh, and what may happen after the war ends and the uh, uh, and this uh, this le legal framework in Ukraine changes is that the husbands that are still in Ukraine can join the families that are in Europe that's a risk obviously Poland and Ukraine here has conflicting interests because in Poland we also have demographic decline and this is something uh, which is like silently omitted in many discussions. But what, can, what Poland can't do that indirectly can, uh, can uh, boost uh, some returns and uh, that will be in, in the interest of Poland is to, uh, uh, to uh, assist in a reconstruction process and a new job creation process in Ukraine. So that will obviously for many f Ukrainian uh, families, refugees, uh, uh, returning home on, on better conditions will be favorable. So, uh, so if we uh, join this process, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna, uh, it, at least it gives a chance to, to support uh, some returns. All right. I haven't seen um, seen any uh, hands raised before. So, if uh, if nobody changed their mind. Um, um, I guess it's time to proceed to uh, to conclusions. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the audience for staying uh, staying this long and uh, staying throughout the end of the already third panel after uh, after the previous uh, very uh, very interesting but also um, uh, uh, meaningful panels. I think that. Uh, um, the speakers at um, at our panel, despite speaking at the last panel, so having the obvious uh, challenges of uh, already talking about the issues which were covered, still um, still managed to uh, and uh, did, did so very efficiently to provide a very thorough picture of the processes which uh, influence and shape. Uh, Polish-Ukrainian relations, uh, also the opportunities and numerous challenges and that, that, that may arise in the process. And uh, I think that especially um, this last element, uh, the challenges that they were, uh, they were very uh, well and thorough covered with, uh, uh, in a very frank way. And I think that um, this exactly, I mean, listing out those challenges and preparing for, for a possible uh, for sp uh, possible challenges and factors that may negatively also influence uh, the process. Uh, it's one of the biggest roles of, uh, of expert community as such and of this, such discussion panels as this one is to list them and be able already to, 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 to brace ourselves for their possible negative impact, to prepare for them and when they arise to ready to be prepared. And uh, uh, the frank character of, uh, of the discussions, the fact that we can openly talk about them, and, uh, I think it's... Uh, it's one of uh, indicators of how far already the Polish uh, Polish Ukrainian relations uh, have gone, and it's a good indicator for the future. Um, so, on this positive note, uh, I would like to thank um, thank the speakers uh, once again: Jadwiga Rogoza, Nadia Koval, Łukasz Damski, and uh, Mikhail Rapak. Thank you very much. And uh, reminder uh, to uh, stay with us for just a few more minutes for a presentation of uh, Ambassador Chkowski.